Hello and welcome to the second session of our FEA Masterclass here at SumScale. My name is Milad and I'm very happy to see so many people who have joined again to learn the fundamentals of a finite element analyzers. Yes, today we will um, talk about material nonlinearity. But before we actually start to dive in into our today's topic, I would like to make sure that everybody can hear me loud and clearly. So please click the raise your hand button in the GoToWebinar app in the case you can hear me. Great, I already see some hands. Okay, seems like everything is working. In the case the uh, uh, audio stream should, should drop for any reason, you can also use our toll-free audio service number. Um, therefore, just dial one of the numbers you can see on the slide and enter the access code 4103503873. Great, yes, as I mentioned today we will talk about material nonlinearity, which is a very important part of most FEA simulations. And first of all we will go through the three um, mo most uh, common types of material behavior, elastic material behavior, plastic material behavior and hyperelastic material behavior. We'll talk about the theory behind this uh, material loss. After that we will do a live demonstration where we'll show you quickly how to apply this different material laws to an existing simulation and after that I will present your homework for this week and we will have time for a Q&A. In the case you have questions, uh, just write them down into our question box and my colleague Anna Flesner will ask, uh, answer them on the fly or in the case uh, that this question seems to be relevant to a large audience we can discuss them in the end during the Q&A. Great, just to make sure that everybody knows what the idea of this workshop series is, I would like to very quickly um, talk about the idea of this webinar since a lot of people joined this week. So uh, as you know, the idea of this workshop series is to um, help users who just get started with FEA to develop their skills and to understand what makes a difference between a colorful picture and the reliable engineering simulation. And uh, you can qualify for a certification of participation by um, submitting all three homeworks. Every session is dealing about the dedicated topic and comes with a, also dedicated online simulation homework. And yes, you can share them with us using a form on simscale.com. Um, but I will talk about this uh, also at the end of this presentation. Just because some people ask me again and again. So first of all we will record this webinar and also uh, the next webinar. So all sessions going to be recorded and we will share uh, the link to the recording together with the homework assignment with you uh, tomorrow after the session. Um, in the case you have trouble with setting up the simulation, please don't reach out to me directly but to use our SimScale forum where we have a dedicated section uh, for this workshop series uh, where my colleagues uh, and I will help you in the case you have questions or if you're struggling with uh, homework. Right. And yes, I think these are the most important things to know about this webinar. And right now we can start to dive in on our today's topic. And uh, as you know, we're going to talk about material nonlinearity, which is a, a huge field of research, let's say. And therefore, we will first of all try to cover the most important fundamentals. And um, therefore, I would like to start with this example. On the left-hand side, you can see a so-called Tangel test machine, which you may saw during your studies. Back then, when I started engineering, it was one of the first labs we had to do and there we had to use such a machine to characterize different material probes. And um, this machine is basically made of very simple components. So first of all, basically what you do, um, you uh, 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 use a sample material, which we can see here. Let me just use my laser pointer. So here we put in our sample material, a sample probe. Uh, between two, two vices, and these vices are uh, elect uh, powered electrical or, or hydraulical, and they are moving away from each other and applying tangential to the probe, they are elongating this probe. And in the end what we are doing, we are measuring the tangential 
So this, this, uh, as, uh, by measuring the strain as well as the stress, the strain can be calculated from the position of the vices, while the stress, which is defined by force divided by cross-sectional area, can be uh, calculated by measuring the forces which are needed to move the vices and divided by the actual cross-section of the sample which is measured uh, during the whole test. And this kind of machine is, is usually used to, to uh, investigate the strength, plasticity, brittleness or elasticity of a material probe. And from this machine you can get the so-called uh, stress strain diagram which is um, showing the stress versus the strain and let's let's imagine we will put a, a metal probe like a steel sample inside this machine and it would start to ramp up the strain and what we could see then is that there seems to be a, a, a proportional relationship between the stress and the strain and if we uh, measure the slope so we divide the rise of stress against the run of strain we will get this constant which is called the Young's modulus and this Young's modulus is, is basically used I would say everywhere in literature where you get introduced to, to material behavior and the very important thing is right now let's, let's think about our steel, steel sample um, within this range of strain I can basically uh, remove the, the load and everything will go back to the initial condition. So just if, if, if I'm running this machine up to this point and I'm turning it off and the vices are going back, we will end here. We will have no uh, remaining deformation of the material and there will be no strain. And just imagine we would increase the strain more and more. What will happen? Because uh, basically we know at some point if we increase the strain more, uh, the stress more and more, the strain more and more, the material will fail. And from what will happen at some point? Uh, you will see something like this. And this is this point where we have this transition from this line to this curve. It's called the yield strength. It's a maximum strength that um, this material can be applied with and if we would increase more and more the strain you would see that first of all the stress is going higher and higher till it reaches maximum then it drops and after this drops somewhere here the material would fail and very interesting is if we take a look at this probe uh, this point here, this maximum, which is called ultimate strength. On the left side, you would see something which is called strain hardening. So um, it becomes harder, stiffer, not not because of the uh, plastical deformation. And once we've uh, exceeded this point of ultimate strength, something will happen which we call knacking. So the cross section of the material will, will, will change and decrease very quickly. And basically here you can see the first two material behaviors which we will talk about today. The first one is the so-called linear elastic material behavior, which describes a material within its uh, uh, within um, this, this this linear behavior. So we need if we want to describe a material like this we need three things we need the young's modulus which is the slope of 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 this graph the straight and we need two other things we need the poisson's ratio and the density the poisson ratio is in the end just gives information about um if this material is compressible or not so just imagine um you have a two-dimensional uh, stress state in two opposite direct uh, in two 90 degree directions and uh, then the Poisson's ratio is the ratio between um, the deformations uh, in both directions and finally we also need a density which is not directly needed 
uh, for calculating the stiffness but needed everywhere where we have gravity load which is applied or gravity forces which are applied. Um, and if we have this plastic material behavior, we also eat the Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio to describe this linear part. But describing this nonlinear part, this curve, is not possible with, with single numbers. And what we need here is a, a, a explicit defined stress drain curve. And uh, most of the materials, special metals, have both of these behaviors. So for, for small loads, they are behaving linear elastic. And once you um, over, ex over exceed the yield strength, they will start to behave like a plastic material. And uh, a very important thing is as long as you are within this linear elastic material behavior, there will be no remaining um, deformation. And um, yes, and based on this, we can define several types of analyzers. So first of all, we have so-called linear analyzers, and basically, we can assume this kind of analyzers everywhere where we have small displacements and strains. Because if you think back, as long as the loads are small and the displacements and strains are small, um, we don't will have plastic behavior. And very important is um, that we really have this linear elastic material behavior because there are also material behaviors which are not plastic but even not linear elastic. And as I mentioned, it's only applicable for smaller loads. And a good example is the simulation, static simulation of the rim. And in contrast to that, nonlinear analysis uh, takes into account large displacement and strains. And a very good example is bending of a pipe, for example. And there are different ways. So you can use elastoplastic material models, for example. But there are also other nonlinear material models, which we will talk about later. And they are applicable for large loads. And a very big misconception is the difference between linear, elastic, and static. So let's, let's again take a look at this linear assumption. So linear assumption also means that we have a linear response of the system. And um, what it also means is that if I have the double displacement, I, or I did I need the double time of force to get the double displacement. And elasticity, which often comes with linear material behavior, means that if you remove the loading, the part returns into its initial shape. And the static assumption, that's very important because these terms are mixed a lot of time. Static has basically nothing to do with linear, plastic, elastic, nonlinear. It just says that the load can be applied in a single step. Let's imagine you have a spring. And for the spring, it makes no difference as long as you are in this linear um, uh, 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 um, material behavior, it does make the difference if you apply the full load at once or step by step. The result will be the same. But if you, for example, have, have a car crash where you have, uh, which is a dynamic phenomena, there is a difference if you don't apply the uh, load as a single step. And these are the things which we have to keep uh, away from each other. We should not mix them up. And just to make it sure what means nonlinear, for sure, if linear means I have a linear relation between force and replacement, for nonlinear, it's not linear anymore. We use it for large replacement rotations. And basically, what we do, and this is also very important to understand why we're talking sometimes about pseudo linear, and since we are solving numerically our equations, and FEA is, is a numerical approach, uh, we even have to uh, solve this nonlinear um, curve. And therefore, we use, again, discretization with linear steps. And a very good example for this nonlinear material assumption is, is, as I also mentioned before, banding or, or deep drawing. Because if you remove the load there, there will stay some permanent deformation. 
And um, what is also very interesting is so-called quasi-static assumption, um, because sometimes it's important to apply the load in several time steps. Just imagine you want to simulate this uh, tangent task. If you would apply the full load at once, you would not get out the data you need. So, and this is what we call a quasi-static assumption. And nonlinear simulations needs to be performed quasi-static or dynamic. Now, let's talk about how to define a linear elastic material in SimScale. You already did it during your last homework, but just to talk again about it, we need Young's modulus, Poisson ratio, and density. So first of all, you give the values. Of the way, what you can also do all the time is importing material uh, properties from our material library, which contains the most common materials used in engineering, like metal materials like steel, aluminium, titanium, but also some other materials like ABS, PLA, and a lot of others. And after you gave the values, you just have to select the volume where you want to apply it. In contrast to that, if you want to use plastic materials, you don't not have only to give um, the value of elastic constants, but also you need to upload the stress strain curve. And there we have different possibilities. Basically, what you need is a CSV file. And let me just show you an example for such files. I have prepared something for you. Um, just one second, guys, sorry. Okay. And here we go. So it looks like this. And if you want to upload it, you just need a text file. Like this. And you can basically choose how you want to define everything with Neostress file. As you can see here, you can upload a file. And uh, during the upload, you can choose which kind of CS file you want to use. So, for example, what is your um, delimiter? Is it a comma, a semicolon? And um, very important is that the stress strain curve usually starts with the yield strength because before you use this elastic behavior. And you have several options also uh, to tune how your nonlinearity is modeled. So first of all, um, you can, for example, change the interpolation. And uh, there we offer rectilinear interpolation. And what you can also do is so-called extrapolation. While the difference is while interpolation is like trying to get values between two points extrapolation is trying to get values outside the range defined and this but the standard settings are fine and uh, you can use them uh, without any problems and since a lot of people ask me in the time where can I get where do I get the stress strain curves or in general the material parameters uh, for most of let's say common materials like metals deals or common uh, uh, polymer materials, you will find a lot of, of example material uh, um, properties and stress strain curves in literature. And every, uh, every time or whenever you use, let's say, material from a, from a, a dedicated manufacturer, I, I'm quite sure this manufacturer will also offer uh, some data sheets about the material, which usually include all this uh, material properties and the stress strain curve. Well, and no. let's talk about the next kind of material, hyperelastic materials. And um, first of all, let's give, let me give you some examples of hyperelastic materials. So, uh, for example, rubber is a very good example, also some, some uh, polymer foams. And hyperelastic materials, so the uh, special thing about them is that this is a class of material which responds elastically uh, when it's subjected to very large strains. 
and it's following some dedicated characteristics. Um, first of all, it can really undergo very, very large elastic deformations, up to 100 to 700 percent. And if you think about metal and the graph I showed you, the stress strain curve at the beginning of this presentation, this is really huge because um, most of metals are failing even much below. 50% of deformation. Another very important point is that they are nearly incompressible. So you cannot push them together, you can just put a tension load on them. And what is also very important, they are elastic, but they show a high non-real stress strain relation. What does it mean? It means that the, the, the graph, and we'll take a look at it just in some seconds, uh, is a relation between stress and strain. It's nonlinear, so it's not a straight, but a kind of curve but it's still elastic in contrast to, to, to plastic materials, which means uh, as soon as we remove the load, everything will go back into its initial states. And what's also very important, under tension, this material softens and then becomes stiffer again. It's looking like a hysteresis curve. And, but if you put compression on it, they have a quite stiff response. And so let us take a look at an example for a, a typical hyperelastic elastomer. And there are basically three types of hyperelastic behavior. So every one of this curve is representing another kind of material or hyperelastic behavior. So we have uniaxial behavior, which is used for tensional loads. And we have, um, which we can see here, we have equibiaxial, which is used for compressive loads, and we have planar shear, which is used for shear loads. They basically have all the same, let's say, shape, but they uh, are looking still different. And um, this kind of material is quite hard to cover. And therefore, in F finite element analysis, we used a so-called hyperelastic theory to represent the nonlinear response of hyperelastic materials at a large strain. And basically, what we do is uh, we are, this kind of material model is not based on the uh, stress strain um, test or on the tangential test, but on a so-called energy function. And basically what we do, we have this function, which is a polynome, and we try to fit these parameters in a way that they are representing the material which we want to describe. And there are a lot of different material uh, uh, laws for hyperelastic material based on this um, uh, energy density function. So here you is the energy, and in this case, it's the sum of this kind of function with coefficients. And the easiest example is the new Hooken material model, which with i is one, so you just have one coefficient. And um, so let's just take a look. There are a lot of different hyperelastic models available on, Sims, on the SimScale platform. And uh, first of all, we have this uh, new Hukin and Mooney Rivalin, which are, I would say, the most most common. They are first order reduced poly polynomial, and they are available for all simulation types. In contrast to that, Signorini is only available for advanced solver types. And what this means, I will show you later. And the other ones um, are only available for the non-advanced solver, like Yeho second order reduced polynomial, etc. And which material model you should use depends on the material you want to model. And uh, as I think uh, you will also again find for every material um, a good, good uh, uh, model in literature. In the case you don't find anything, all the need you need is again a stress strain curve. And then we will try to fit these um, parameters in order to, to use one of these models. And uh, just to show you how to define hyperelastic material, you, ch you choose first of all the uh, model you want to use, 
you give the fitted values and then you select the volume where you want to assign this material model. Great, so um, this was our quick journey through uh, the different material models and right now I would like to do a quick live demo with you. Um, in the case you have questions, just write them down and we will try to answer them. And yes, first of all let me just switch to my web browser and here I've already prepared a project in SimScale. And just to make sure we don't waste time, I have prepared all the steps but we will just go through it. And um, yes, after, after my demonstration we'll also talk about your homework which is based on the simulation project. So first of all, um, what can we see here? It's basically a wheel. And let's please just jump one slide ahead. And here you can see basically what we want to simulate. This is a bike wheel. And what we want to simulate right now, it's, it's uh, from this uh, child children bikes. And we want to simulate now uh, what happens on those static load. And first of all, we simplify our problem. So um, last session I talked about how to simplify your model and a very big advantage you should try to, to use is to uh, use symmetries. And first of all here we have a symmetry in that y direction since our load is also symmetrical. So we just need half of the wheel here and since the end we have the same symmetry or same kind of symmetry in xz direction and therefore we will save 75% of the elements. And Basically what we do, we have this wheel which is made of a tire and a rim and then we have this plate here and we are in the end just simulating like what is happening during driving. And um, we want to simulate this right now and the tire as well as the wheel are made of different materials. So the tire is usually made of rubber while the rim is made of some kind of plastic. And first of all, therefore, let's take a look at the cat model. We have three solids here. We have the rim, the wheel and this ground contact patch. And first of all, we have to create the mesh. And here you can see the final mesh which is made out of three zones. We have uh, yes, a, a mesh with, with adapted refinements for, for rim and tire and we have a very coarse mesh for the ground. Does anybody have the idea why we use this very coarse mesh for the ground? If you have an idea just write into the question window. Let's see if someone is right. Yes, exactly. I think Hamza gave the right question. We are not, and Dar Darren also, we are not interested in the stress of the ground. Michael also gave a good explanation. Yes, exactly. We are interested in the wheel and therefore <laughs> investing elements, investing resources in the floor makes no sense. And um, now let's take a look how we created this mesh. Basically, uh, this is what we talked about last week, but I think let's refresh it. So first of all, we start to define a mesh operation, use TED dominant and did first uh, the first approach automatic meshing, moderate, first order on 32 cores. But this would lead to a quite coarse mesh, therefore we added several refinements. The first refinement which we added is here um, and this one is a automatic refinement for local element size with the mesh fineness 4 which was applied on this face here. And this is our floor. The next one was applied on the whole volume of the floor 
a manual element sizing with the element edge lengths between 1 meter and 1000 meter and very coarse mesh grading and we only made it to make sure that we have the minimum number of elements possible here. And I think this is much more interesting for you because we also did, we added two additional refinements. One of them was added to solid 2 and to phases 3, 4 and 5 which we can see here and another one was applied on faces 4, 6 and 7 which we kind of can find here and then we finally got the mesh, everything worked fine and next step is to set up the simulation. And first of all, we have to choose our analysis type. Again, static analysis advanced. And the next thing we have to do is defining contacts. We have not talked about contacts yet during this course, but since contacts are used in most of the cases, I think a lot of you know what they are, let's just maybe quick talk about them. Uh, so since this model is an assembly made of three solid bodies, we have to define how these bodies are interacting. And the very first thing here is that if you take a look, we have the rim and the tire. And without the contact, these parts would not be connected. And therefore what we do, we define the so-called bounded contact, which means they are following each other with a position tolerance of one centimeter. So as long as the displacement is not larger as one centimeter, you will be able to find uh, the, the, the faces. And basically we have a master entity and a slave entity. And the slave is following the master. And our master entity is the rim. And our slave entity Here are the corresponding faces of the tire. And we also need the so called physical contact. And in contrast, contrast to the uh, uh, geometrical contact, the physical contract is needed to define, let's say, the interaction between the floor or the ground and the whole tire assembly. And what we do here is basically, first of all, we have to choose a type. And there are a lot of different physical contact types. We will choose frictionless penalty contact. We have to enter penalty coefficient. And then we have to define the master phase, which is the ground, and the slave phase, which is the face of the tire, which is in contact with the ground. Um, and in this case, um, it really makes sense to do it this way around because the floor will not, probably not move. The next thing we have to do is to define the materials. And here we see, first material is rubber. And here, as I mentioned, rubber basically is a hyperelastic material. But what we did here is we tried to, to model it with linear elastic material property we used concentrate material model for the floor and polypropylene also linear elastic model for the rim. And we did the same things basically, we copied the simulation and there we changed for example the material model for the rubber, uh, for the um, rim to plastic and in the third simulation we changed uh, not only the material model for the rim to plastic, but also for the tire to hyperelastic. Yes, and maybe just some common things between the simulation, uh, just to show you how we set up the boundary conditions. So for the ground, we use the fixed support, so no of the faces of this uh, whole, whole floor piece can move. We applied symmetries here. And here we have a fixed value support here for this where uh, the wheel meets uh, uh, um, the shaft. 
and we have a so-called elastic support here, which is representing in the end somehow the B-ring, which we don't simulate right now. Great, and finally we have a load of a cycle plus a baby of 20 kilogram. Great, and we just run the three simulations. The great thing again is you can set up one simulation. Let me just show it to you quickly. For example, this one. You can duplicate it. And if you want to change something, for example, let's make this um, the rim out of, we want to change the rim to plastic material behavior. We just change this to plastic. Then we can just select a stress strain. We use the comma to separate it. Upload. And now we change the material with one click. And once the simulations are finished, I mean, let's just maybe take a look. So. Don't worry, you will get a step-by-step instructions for the simulation. And uh, also very important, what we did here, we ramped the load. Um, basically, which we can see here. So we used the formula. The load is minus 505 multiplied with time. This is a pseudo time. And if you see here, we are ramping up the time from 0 0.1 to 1. So the final load we have is minus 5.5 newtons. Great. And once the simulation is finished, we can take a look at the Kolmogens plot and, for example, also on some volume calculations we defined in advance. So this is, for example, how the, how the stress is changing with applied, applied force. And we can also take a look at the three-dimensional result field, as you know. Okay, then let's take a look at some results. So, first of all, this is strain stress curve of uh, polypropylene. And the, this is the material we used for the rim. And you can see here we have again those. We have a linear regime on the left side of this red curve, where we have linear behavior. Then we have a yield strands of 18 megapascal, and then we have this nonlinear material behavior. And here you can see the results for all three simulations. So this is where everything is elastic, and as we expected, we have a linear relation between the stress and the applied force. And if we use a plastic material model for the rim for a certain force we have this nonlinear material behavior and the plastic deformation and if we use hyperelastic material model for the tire and a plastic material model for the rim so the change between here and here is just the material model of the tire we get some completely different results so here it's even not linear anymore at the beginning and the reason for show is the interaction between the tire and the rim. And I hope that this is a good lesson for you, because this means if you use, for example, a wrong material model somewhere in the model, which is not, um, uh, let's say, uh, pliable uh, uh, for your load or for this case, this can for sure lead to wrong results even in parts of your model where everything is perfect, like, uh, where the material model is right. So I hope that this really shows you how important it is to choose the right material model, which is right for your material and also for your load case. And for example, here we can see the maximum for my stress on the rim. 
uh, uh, and if you use a wrong model, you will get much too high values. Here, for example, we can see the displacement for three different cases, and you can really see how the whole results change and how big the effect of this hyperelastic material for the tires. Uh, so here, basically, uh, the max displacement is, is happening uh, inside the rim while using the hyperelastic material, the maximum displacement is happening uh, on the tire. And we're talking, anyways, about 6 mm of displacement here. And if we take a look at the stress, you can really see that here, because as you see, red marks our yield thread. So everywhere where it becomes red will have plastic deformations. And here you can see that we get plastic deformation at the rim. And just imagine if you would not use the right material model for the tires, a hyperplastic material model, you would get wrong information. You would say, think that this rim will last, but actually this rim will not last because you're running into plastic um, deformation. Michael asked, which model tends to be the most accurate in this case? And since we're using rubber, definitely the hyperelastic uh, tire model is the most um, accurate in this case. And if you, for example, take a look at the displacement and the stress, okay, it's still the same stress here, you can also see that we really have some difference, especially here in these areas. Okay, great. I hope you enjoyed this live demo, and now I would like to present your homework to you. And this week, your job is to just to perform the simulation on it yourself. You don't have to do everything. Uh, so we'll just provide you with two different cases. What you do basically is to prepare the simulation, copy it, change the material model, and uh, again, you will find everything you need in a step-by-step -step tutorial, the recording, this homework submission form on synthday.com slash FEA masterclass. And I will send an email to you tomorrow, including all materials you need to do this homework assignment. And right now, I would say, let's start the Q&A. So in the case you have questions, just write them down, and I will try to answer them. So, uh, wait, give me just one second. So, the, we have some, guys, don't you have any questions? First of all, um, the, um, there is a question by Michael, if uh, this method can also be used to predict post-yield fail analysis. Michael, in theory, that is possible, but for sure, whenever it comes to deal with um, post yield fail analysis, you really need some good material models. And this is really, I would say, one of the toughest things with FEA. But for sure, this is possible. Um, some people ask if we can send them, especially um, the, the PDF version of the slides. Uh, unfortunately, um, because of some copyright reason, it's not possible to send out the slides. Um, but uh, in the end, they're included uh, in the presentation. Sorry for that. Are there some more questions? Not really, okay. It seems like all your questions were answered during the sessions. Oh, no, there are some questions. Okay, a question by, I hope I pronounced it right, Roller off. Uh, he said, Mila, you showed us contact. What makes the master, the master, and the slave? How do you choose the master and the slave? Um, very good question. Um, let me, just give me one second, and I will try. I think I have some, some good slides which I can show you for this. Um, yes. Whoa, okay, uh, 
and I think that Okay, now you should see a different slide, right? This is a slide from a previous workshop, the uh, Maker Workshop, which you can also watch on YouTube. And I don't want to talk about the simulation detail, but this is a very good example where we needed contact. So what we did here is we did a, a vibrational analysis, a frequency analysis, and a mnemonic analysis of the 3D printer frame. And if you reduce the problem to this part, you see it's also again made of several parts It's an assembly. And um, besides the boundary condition, we have contacts. And for example, if you take a look here, we have this metal rods where we fuse the nuts and we have this plastic connectors. And here we have our first contact and here's the second one and here's the third. And um, basically, um, what is the master and the slave depends on what you think what will physically happen. So you have to think like this, uh, the contact making sure that your part, as the name says, of the assembly stay in contact. And the master is the one which is like moving and the slave is following, so you should choose uh, uh, sometimes it's a question of philosophy. In this case, for example, I would say that um, definitely the, um, the rod should be the slaves and um, you should choose this faces as a uh, master's faces which are like, let's say, deforming more, moving more. Um, or they say if it's reasonable to build a library of stress strain curves for common materials, Yes, for sure, that would make sense. Also something which is on our list, on our to-do list for the next releases of SimScale. Here a big problem is that um, the stress-strain curve really depends not only on the material, but also on how it was fabricated. And therefore most of our engineers want to use the stress-strain curves which are provided by the manufacturer of the material itself. Um, okay. Okay, next question is by Michael. Uh, he wants to know if we use the contact elements to also model impact loads where the parts are initially separated. Um, there are two kinds of contacts, Michael, you should not forget. We use the standard contacts to define how these different parts of the model are connected and we use the physical contact to resolve uh, uh, the point or the area where the tire is hitting the ground. And for example, if you want uh, to know like jumping over something, you could also need a physical contract. Uh, Georgi wants to know if it's possible to conduct plastic analysis with autotropic materials. It's not possible right now. Uh, right now we are only supporting isotropic materials, but this is something which will come soon. Um, yes, Michael, there's by the way, because Michael asked if it's for example possible to use contact for a bouncing rubber ball, there is a very good uh, library project check out uh, where a ball is, is uh, hitting a goal as a outer rod of a goal. You should take a look at it. Great, seems I answered all the questions. There's a final question. Uh, Ole wants to know what will happen if the 3000 core hours expired in the free version. This is not a problem. You can just reach out to our support team and we will usually uh, upgrade your core hours within one day. Guys, thank you very much for joining us for this session. It was a great pleasure. I hope to see you next week for our final session. If you have questions, please reach out to us using the forum. Have a nice week and a good time. See you next week. Bye.